I'm reading from verses 47 onwards, chapter 11, Vishwarupa Darshan Yoga. The Blessed Lord said, Pleased with you, O Arjuna, I have shown you through the yoga of self this transcendent form of mine, consisting of light, being universal, being endless, being the first one, which was never seen by anyone other than you before. Neither through the Vedas, sacrifices or studies, nor by charities, nor by actions, nor by fierce ascetic observations, can I be seen in this form in the human world by anyone other than you, O oh, the bravest among gurus. Be not afraid, nor be confused seeing this, such a fearsome form of mine. Dismissing your fear with a happy mind, see again this same previous form of mine. Sanjay said, the indwelling one, having addressed Arjuna thus, showed him again his own previous form and consoled him as he was afraid, the great-souled one again assuming a pleasant body, looking body. So what does this formless cosmic self or universal self look like? It is made up of light. Its being is universal. Its being is endless. It is the first one. It's eternal, it never dies. It's difficult for us to imagine this. And it is not something that one can imagine because it is beyond the mind. To imagine, we need the mind. But the mind cannot imagine something that is beyond itself. Therefore, it's not possible to imagine. We can only try to f draw parallels and try to get a feel of it. But we will always miss. This is the indescribable. And how shall we attain this formless? Well, the answers are more in the negative. You will definitely not attain it through the studies of Vedas, not through Vedic sacrifices or any other forms of sacrifice. Here, sacrifice means um, referring to rituals, ritualistic sacrifice. It cannot be attained through intellectual studies. If that were the case, it would be quite easy, relatively easy, to study a few texts and attain, but it is not the case. You can perform many charities. It's good work, but that will not give you a glimpse of that formless self. You can perform good actions, or all sorts of actions, but even that will not help you attain this formless self. There are many who have tried to take very strict ascetic vows, thyaga, very strict forms, also known as tapas. And this has nothing led to nothing other than self-torture. So even that cannot help us to attain a glimpse of the universal self. But having seen this, this little glimpse, Sri Krishna tries to console Arjun because Arjun is terrified, he is afraid. Why should he feel afraid? Why is this a fearsome, formless self?
we have heard about different spiritual traditions in the world having different concepts. In some religions, for example, the religions of the book, the, the male principle is very, very strong in the religions of the book. And the concept of God is that of a fearsome God. God is very strict. In the Eastern philosophies or philosophies of life philosophies, you can say they're not really religions, the concept of God is compassionate, is loving, like a mother. So in these Eastern traditions, God is more feminine, has more feminine qualities. All the same, there is a, a sense of fear that seems to appear on a kundalini experience. When one attains that glimpse, a glimpse of that universal self, which is God. Why do some perceive it as fearsome and others experience it as loving, compassionate? Why the difference? Well, one can say that the idea of the universal self or God being fearsome comes from those at an initial stage, the first glimpse may appear to be fearsome. Initial stages that is experienced as frightening. We used the example in a previous session of a, a great power. And can imagine that one of the greatest sources of power that we know is nuclear power, atomic power. Imagine that you would be in the presence here, you know, in the center of a nuclear reactor and you see this nuclear reactor, right? They're the core, the very core of it. And of course, it's very powerful. It's very dangerous to be in there. You know, you have to cover your head and everything when you go in there. You're in the presence of God. It's just like going into the sanctum sanctorum. So you experience fear because it has the power to destroy. And what can it destroy? It can destroy your sense of your identity, your self-identity, which is also known as Ahankara. So those who have been blessed with this glimpse, have attained a little glimpse of this, you can say that they have come into the presence of the divine but they were impure. There was still ahankara. There were traces of ahankara. There was a lot of ahankara, perhaps. And these self-identities get panicky. They get worried because they know that in order to be established in this universal self, these petty self-identities must be dissolved. Only when these petty self-identities, these little ones, are dissolved, can we expand, be established in the universal self. And when that does happen, we experience it as pure love, compassion, love, unconditional like that of a mother for her infant. So then it is described in a very feminine way. But before that, it is described like the love of a father. Very powerful, authoritarian love. But powerful, strict, or a little bit dangerous. Father may scold you. Mother may also, but she's generally much more loving. And so we perceive 
this experience of divinity as fearsome or as loving and compassionate, depending on the level of development. Any thoughts or questions on this? So what happens when you are in the presence of such tremendous power? Some point of time you are so uneasy, so nervous, so full of energy, you have to get out of there. Imagine being at the very core, the center of a nuclear reactor, and you, you're always afraid, you always feel, oh my God, this is so powerful, I have to get out of here. And once you get out of there, you heave a sigh of relief, Oof. back to normality back to normal life. And so it was for Arjuna. He said, Seeing this pleasant human form of yours, O Krishna, I have recovered my senses and returned to my natural feelings. So it was good to touch the divine, but it is good to be back to my familiar, normal human self, to be back to this body and to this consciousness that I'm, I'm used to. You're not used to this expanded consciousness. It is overwhelming. So you're happy to come back to your very normal human consciousness. This is a phenomenon that occurs repeatedly in the process of sadhana, practice, if the practice is done systematically. If the practice is not done systematically, people spend years of their life doing something, but not really attaining anything. And by systematic practice is meant through guidance in a tradition that is leading to the highest. There are traditions that are only interested at the physical level or at the intellectual level. So we are referring to those tantric traditions that take you to the highest. And with such a systematic practice, a certain phenomena is observed repeatedly. And that is, when you do systematic practice and you gain some insights little bit of expansion of consciousness. Not much, but a little bit. You need some time to integrate that energy until the next little glimpse. Again, a little bit of expansion of consciousness. You need some time to integrate it. And until you have not integrated this, you probably will not experience any further expansion of consciousness. So it seems like you go to plateau every now and then where you need time to rest and to integrate that energy. The word rest is in Sanskrit ashram and so it's not a coincidence that an ashram place for meditation is considered to be a place for resting. It's a place where you withdraw, you focus your energies, you integrate these energies and you take that time to, to rest. This process has been observed. It comes in waves. It seems to come in waves every time and I have mentioned this often to some of you that when you are riding the wave 
go with it, it's very nice, you feel good. Don't get very disappointed then when nothing seems to happen after that for a while. And you think, oh, I'm not progressing, I'm stuck. It's not that you are stuck. It's not as if you're not progressing. You just need time to integrate what you have acquired, that new energy, those new insights. That's the process of integration, which is very important. If you don't learn that, if we get impatient, we want to have more and more, but do not allow that energy to be integrated. What will happen? It's exactly what I described earlier. Uh, a short circuit, a fuse, you know, you're going to uh, implode or explode. It's too much. Your body is still not purified. Your mind and body is still not purified enough to handle that kind of energy. So <clears throat> that can be dangerous. To forcefully expand your consciousness is very dangerous. Which is why Shakti part cannot be given to those who are unprepared. Even if it is given, it is given only to those who are highly prepared and just as a little push to somebody who needs a little touch and can get back you know, on track because he's a bit stuck. It's not given at a mass level. It's not given to anybody who's unprepared just because they keep saying, oh, please give me this Shakti part and, you know, begging for, for something. You have to prepare yourself. Otherwise, it is a danger to yourself. No master, no teacher, all the compassionate ones would, would withhold something beautiful from you if it weren't that there is a, a double-edged sword. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, but it's a deadly power and it is to be handled very carefully. Another reason why we say in our tradition, nadatavyam, 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 don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. Imparted only to those who are ready. Any thoughts? Any questions? Uh, hi. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, just, just a thought that came to me when you were describing this. Somehow it describes, uh, it, it makes, it gave me the memory of a uh, let's say a parent who doesn't give a car key to a child, it doesn't mean that you know, uh, the parent doesn't want the child to, I, I don't know, this image somehow came, came to me. It's just, uh, yeah, it's more for the welfare of the child than for, but although the child may think, that, uh, yeah, the parent is trying to sabotage my life or something like that. <laughs> yes. It just came to Yes, it's it like, a, a, like a teenager who thinks the, the parents are being spoiled spots. And uh, they don't want to be disciplined. And they just uh, think that the parents are, you know, being unfair. And of course, that's not the case. It's just that um, sometimes you need to be protected from yourself. If you're very impatient and if you don't maybe trust your teacher or you have a very high opinion of yourself, and a lot of students do, the egos are very strong, ahankara is not polished, and then... Um, they, they insist on having all sorts of things even though they're not ready. And some people are just purely impatient. Okay. So verses 52 to 55. The Blessed Lord said, This form of mine, very difficult to see, that you have seen. Even gods are ever desirous of seeing this form. Not through the Vedas, nor by ascetic observations, nor by charity, nor through sacrifices,
can I be seen in this nature as you have seen me? O Arjuna, only through devotion directed towards none other than I be seen and known in reality and be entered, O scorcher of enemies. Performing my act, holding me as supreme, my devotee devoid of attachments. Whoever is free of animosity toward all beings, he comes to me. So it is very clear that to experience this universal self or this formless self is very difficult, very unusual, very rare. Therefore, all the more privileged is the one who does attain a glimpse of it. And that is a very valuable moment or moments to be cherished. And if the experience is intense enough, then it is a life-transforming, life-changing experience. If it is very mild, you forget about it. So many of us have experienced what is known as fleeting samadhis. When you are taking a walk in the moonlight, in, in the mountains, under the stars, when you're watching a river flowing gently, when you you look at a flower blossoming. It could be simple things. It could be mundane things. But something shifts in you. You could be just looking at the traffic. And the light, the traffic light changes from red to green. It could be something as mundane as that. But something shifts in your perception. And... You're in that moment, suddenly transported. And you see this universal form where everything is connected. All beings are one. Time seems to stand still. And you experience this awe. And that is rare. It says, once again, you cannot attain that by studying Vedas, practicing some rituals, not even through tiaga or tapas, not through charities, none of these things. Only through one-pointed devotion, ananya bhava. Devotion directed towards none other. Ananya Bhava is a one pointed devotion when all your attachments and aversions have dissolved. You don't look upon enemy or anybody as your enemy, you're not attached to anybody or anything. Only such a one can have that kind of one-pointed mind. This bhava that rises when the mind is one-pointed is that of pure love and reasonless joy. It is only through ananya bhava, such a bhava that you can attain the universal self or at least a glimpse of it. Any thoughts about that? Ananya Bhava sounds so lovely. Balaji, all good there? Okay, Balaji doesn't say anything. 
Maybe Balaji has fallen into a deep silence and attained Ananya Bhava. That would be nice. He comes out of it, then he will tell us how it was. Any thoughts or questions? Miklos, Yohim, all good. This is the last verse of this chapter. So anybody wants to say something about this particular chapter can go ahead. Yeah, all good. Okay. <laughs> oh, you both have attained some Ananya Bhava there. Yeah, you disturbed us. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm outside. I'm on mute mode. Oh, okay. We were beginning to think that you have already attained the universal self and you were stunned speechless by no. the beauty of that. <laughs> no, no, I'm in Zoom corner, so it may be very noisy. So right. I'm going to pick the kids. No problem. That's fine. <laughs> so that was the last verse of um, chapter 11 which is called Vishwarupa uh, Darshan Yoga. It is one of my favorite chapters, by the way, and um, very beautiful. We go on to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is called Bhakti Yoga. The last verse was, as you, as you know, Ananya Bhava, about this beautiful bhava that takes you, carries you, to the formless self. You cannot get there through rituals, nor through um, charities, nothing, no actions of yours, but through this beautiful bhava which carries you. And even the gods, the celestial beings, even they desire to attain that. So this chapter goes further into this idea of bhakti or bhava, of formless versus form, you know, which is, which is better. <clears throat> so we continue. Arjun said, Those devotees ever engaged in yoga who worship you thus and those who worship the unmanifest, indestructible syllable, among them which are the highest masters of yoga, Arjun is very curious. He is very interested in knowing. He has many questions. He is an adhikari, one who inquires. He doesn't ask questions to show off his knowledge. He's not asking questions because he has a, a strong ahankara. He's not asking questions to, to impress his teacher. He is not asking questions because he likes to hear the sound of his own voice. He is asking these questions because he is driven by a deep longing for the highest. He wants to have the overview, understand the whole thing, the nature of life and death, the mysteries of these. He wants to solve them. He wants to understand the nature of the universe. He wants to know who he is, his true nature. So he's motivated by these questions. And now he comes to this question, which has become a bit of a debate. He asks what a lot of seekers are asking still to this day. What is better? What is the superior path? Is it better to, to worship you in this personal form? Or in this unmanifest self? The indestructible syllable is Om, the unmanifested. So he's asking an age-old question again. Which one is to be preferred? There are many people who worship gods, goddesses. Most of us know of 
um, different religions where they have icons, idols, and not just I'm not just referring to Hinduism, but even in religions which are considered to be non, uh, you know, supportive of of such things. For example, even in Buddhism, they will have sages or idols of uh, bodhisattvas. Uh, Christianity, of course, has an idol. And uh, Islam, which is the most uh, radical of them all, has no form of personal worship, as in personal gods. But you see... Uh, it's still important for them to have a place to go to. So they, they need to have a, a place where they can pilgrim to. And they they still go around this, around the Kaaba. So it seems a human need to have something solid, something concrete, something that one can relate to, a place in space, an object of some sort. And the question is, which is superior, which is better? The people who have, who practice or who preach Advaita, the formless path, you know, the, the non-dualistic path, are like those who talk about the one God and they destroy all idols. It's the same thing. These people consider the worship of idols or or God in any form, to be a lower path. Those who worship God in the form of some personal God consider the, the ones practicing or, or, or at least talking about a formless, unmanifested self as, oh, just intellectual, you know, uh, too difficult. So this debate or this battle between these two has been going on since centuries, maybe even millennia, I would say. So, what is the answer? The Blessed Lord said, Those who ever joined in yoga, entering their mind into me, worship me, endowed with highest faith, I believe them to be the most united in yoga. Which means... It does not matter whether you prefer to meditate upon form or upon the formless. As long as you perform your worship, the upasana, worship with your full attention, with full mind, full heart, with the bhava, as long as you are completely there, it does not matter whether you choose form or formless. Both lead to the same. So the words of Sri Krishna should have ended that debate, but it didn't. People are still discussing this and still debating and Followers of Advaita, including Shankara, went around preaching, converting people to his way. Others said that the path of rituals and form is the most important. And so this discussion continues to this day. From our perspective, I think it's important to understand that we need form as well as formless. If you see the world around you, it's full of forms and we need it. This is the world where we live out our samskaras. If we can see this, all these forms as filled with consciousness, then you have attained something. You do not have to reject these forms. You do not have to reject the world. You can live in it and still stay above it. If you would see these forms purely lifelessly, just 
as forms, just dull matter, without seeing that beauty behind it, then you would fall into this maya, basically, and be lost. So, from this perspective, you see we need both. And this is known as Advaita Advaita. We need both. The higher understanding is that actually we need both. Sri Krishna elaborates in verses 3 to 5. Those, however, who worship the indestructible syllable, the unmanifest, that cannot be specified, the all-pervading, beyond thought, absolute, immovable, permanent one, who control the group of senses well, hold all to be alike, everywhere, delight in benefiting all beings, they find only me. They have greater difficulty, whose minds are drawn to the unmanifest. The unmanifest way is found with difficulty by those who are dwelling in bodies. So, it says, both the parts are right, whether form or formless. However, it is a difficult for those who are dwelling in a body to attain the formless, the unmanifest. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it is difficult. So it is a more difficult path. And we know that, that most people in the world, if you look around, they are not much interested in the yogic path or in meditation. They are very happy performing rituals to their chosen gods or um, trying to appease gods and goddesses because they wish to uh, get favors. While the unmanifest path is, cannot be specified, it's all pervading. For that you need to control your senses. You need to transform yourself. And that is much more difficult to do. And because the unmanifest path, the un sorry, unmanifested is so difficult to grasp, it is not very popular and is considered by the others as too intellectual, too difficult, and mostly people give up very fast. So any thoughts on verses 1 to 5? Any comments, any questions? Some of the um, chapters to follow now are much shorter than the earlier chapters. And um, so, of course, it may happen that we are able to sometimes finish uh, one chapter in one session. It's not because um, there's nothing to talk about. It's just that the chapters are shorter and... Um, We simply go through them faster. Verses 6 to 8. However, they who renounce all actions unto me are intent upon me. They worship me. 
meditating with yoga directed to no other. Their minds absorbed in me, I soon become their deliverer from the ocean of deaths and worldly cycle, O son of Pitha. Settle your mind only in me. Enter your intellect into me. Henceforth, you will live only in me. There is no doubt. This is the highest path. This is what Sri Krishna mentioned earlier when he called it Ananya Bhava. Those who have Ananya Bhava, that Bhava where the only thing you want is that beauty, you experience that longing inside of you, you have tasted it and you want only that. Nothing else will satisfy you. It is like a lover who is continuously and constantly thinking of the beloved. He is separated from the beloved and then the only thing he can think about is his beloved. A mother with a little infant. All those who have little babies or have had babies know that the mother is constantly got... The, it's not even thought, it's an emotion. It's just that this child, this baby, is with the mother all the time. It's not about the, the thought of the child, it's not the name of the child, it's not a picture of the child which is with the mother, it's just the, the child is always present. That is why very often we worship the form of mother and child. It's a symbol of unconditional love. When you can love and long for the divine as much, then you will attain. That's the fastest way. If you can long for this as a lover longs for his beloved, you don't think about anything else. You're not interested in anything else. Always meditating upon the highest. The minds are absorbed. Such a one is delivered from the ocean of death and the worldly cycle very fast. Such a mind is known as a one-pointed mind. There are no more conflicts. You don't suddenly start thinking, oh, um, how shall I pay the electricity bills? Who's going to pay for the food bills? You know, Because this thought doesn't occur to you. It's irrelevant. That kind of longing it does not matter anymore. Such a one is taken care of by the universe. Such a one-pointed mind is known as Ekagra. Any thoughts or comments about this? Questions? It may seem a little obsessive to only think of the divine it may seem like such a person has become too fanatical and has become limited in a certain way, has no other interests. But that seems to be also a, a, a modern idea that we have when somebody is deeply uh, involved in a certain um, path of, say, career. You know, if he's very passionate about art and becomes a famous artist, that's considered good. 
So he's totally dedicated to his career and becomes a CEO of a multinational. That's considered good. But if he is equally uh, involved with his own spiritual development and is willing to give up everything, not that he's even giving up anything because it's just that he is not interested in anything else, everything else falls away. Such a one attains naturally. He doesn't really have to renounce because all these other things, worldly objects, relationships, are all secondary to that fire which is inside, which is always longing for the highest. You know, the fire is a beautiful symbol. You know, the flames of a fire, they always reach up to the sky. They're always going upwards. Has anybody seen fire with the flames going downwards? I haven't. They're longing to go higher, up, 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 further up. And when that longing is there for the energy to go up and attain the highest, everything else falls away. With such a mind... It's one-pointed, you can attain. And while it may sound obsessive or unhealthy to us, it seems to be the, the only way to be successful in anything. If you want to be successful, as I said, in, in athletics, you know that some athletes, they, they train for... 8 hours, 10 hours a day. They do extreme, from our perspective, for a person, a normal person, who is not a trained athlete, seems to be an extreme lifestyle. And so, from somebody else's perspective, a one-pointed mind, a person with a one-pointed mind, would be also leading an extreme lifestyle. That is the way of uh, attaining some form of success. If you don't experience that urgency and you spend a lot of time doing all sorts of things, that's okay. That means you're not that passionate about it yet. So what do we do if you're not passionate? What do we do if you do not experience this ananya bhava? Any questions, by the way, on those few verses, verses 6 to 8? <clears throat> on the one-pointed mind, on ananya bhava? In that case, <clears throat> verses 9 to 11. Now, if you cannot harmonize a stilled mind in me, then desire to find me through the, pra the yoga of practice, O Arjuna. If you are not even capable of practicing and become intent on my acts, even performing actions for my sake, you will gain fulfillment. Now, if you are unable to do this, then resorting to my yoga, do renounce the fruit of all actions with your mind and self under control. So, what if you don't have a one-pointed mind? And if you're not able to attain that one-pointed mind, in that case, strengthen your longing. For the highest. Practice some form of abhyasa. Yoga practices abhyasa. Generally what was prescribed was some sort of japa or some sort of rituals. So if you're not even able to do japa or rituals, you can perform actions. You know, some sort of karma yoga. And 
So the prescription is to do something, anything with the right intention and keep continuing on the path. Do not give up, even if you don't have a one-pointed mind. The next verse actually um, is a little bit more clear, so I will just read that. Verse 12 explains, Knowledge is better than practice. Meditation is distinguished as greater than knowledge. Higher than meditation is announcing the fruits of action. Immediately after renunciation comes peace. So for those who wanted to know and understand the difference in paths and wanted to understand which path is superior or more appropriate, get a more clear understanding through this verse. So it explains that basically you do abhyasa. It could be some sort of mechanical, ritualistic practice. It could be some form of japa. But better than that is knowledge. Knowledge, jhana. The dangers of jhana is that it can become very intellectual. So if you have not really attained jhana, through life experience, merely through book knowledge, then there is a higher path. And the higher path is dhyana, meditation, a systematic practice, the help of a teacher. And so this is superior. And this can help you progress systematically over a period of time. It is superior to the other parts because there seems to be a system and it's not just something which happens. It's not something which happens mechanically, nor is it purely uh, book knowledge or if it is through life experience, that's kind of hit and miss. It's not systematic. It can happen or not happen. Therefore, the honor is a higher path than the other two because it's systematic. You can call upon it whenever you need guidance from your inner self. And you, you gain a certain mastery over your own life, become more independent. So dhyana is definitely something Higher, higher even than jhana. And higher than dhyana is karma phala tyaga. Karma phala tyaga is not just equal to karma yoga. Karma yoga is often misunderstood as a bit of a, you know, a mechanical path where people say, I'm doing karma yoga. And then you go and clean the garden or, or you prepare some food. But that is not karma yoga. You're doing some actions, maybe some voluntary work, some service. But here, renunciation of the fruit of actions is meant. This means that your dhyana has ripened, has matured. When dhyana matures, when it, it ripens, it means that you have purified your mind. The samskaras are not that, that strong, that powerful. And you're able to do something because it's your duty without expecting reward. So as parents take care of their children, lovingly, without expecting anything from them. You should perform all actions. 
I'm well aware that many parents do expect their children to behave well. If not, they, they withdraw their love. We are not talking about those kind of parents. We're talking about parents, especially when children are very small, in the infants, you love them in unconditionally and you take care of them. You don't expect a reward from a, a little child, right? So, in that sense, performing action for the love of it. Because it's your duty. Just as you perform action when you have a, a hobby, something you're passionate about, like gardening. So this is the highest. This goes in the direction of Param Vairagya or Vairagya. And that is the highest. Okay. Any thoughts, questions? Okay, maybe we should stop here. The hour is over and it's, a, it's also a good place to stop. This chapter is very short. And so um, we will definitely finish it next time. And as I mentioned, following chapters are also not very long. And we can then um, stop right here. <laughs>